I, I showed this chart uh, in our last Friday presentation, and uh, and and we had another monthly Michigan survey of consumers that came out, and uh, and so um, I just wanted to update this chart, and I think it's it's um, it's highly representative of the of one of the big dilemmas that we that we face today, and and you know, I like to call it the Fed is trapped, uh, but um, in, in the sense that we have this historic divergence between. Uh, between consumer inflation expectations and uh, and what um, and what government CPI statistics uh, reflect as as ongoing uh, as as inflation and inflation expectations. So there's something called the 10-year break even. What is that? It's the it's the Treasury inflation protected uh, securities and, and there's different maturities. There's a 10-year tips it's called treasury inflation protected security that uh, implicit in in the tips is is this expectation market expectation of what inflation will be but it's not really what of what inflation will will be it's really of what cpi will be the consumer price index and so uh so according to the Mich university of michigan consumer survey the average u.s consumer believes that inflation uh, will be 6.2 percent over the next five to 10 years. Uh, it's a survey of, of some 800 people that, that the University of Michigan has been doing for like 50 years. And they, they update this thing every month. And, they, uh, and, and um, this is the mean expectation among these 800 people that are surveyed uh, of what inflation will be over the next five to 10 years. Well, how, well, how can the 10 year uh, inflation expectation in the, in the CPI in the tips market be so different well because it's government statistics of inflation uh, and that's called the consumer price index or the cpi and that's what the tips market the tips treasury market is based upon so what this shows is that you know consumers believe and have always believed as the, as the chart shows because the red line has always been above the turquoise line consumers believe that uh you know inflation will actually be higher than what than what government statistics report in, in, in inflation to be, and and what the tips market, uh, you know, prices it it to be implicit in, in the market for CPI. So, um, so, um, so what? So what's you know what's really going on here? What we're showing is this this recent divergence, this recent spread between the two. One going one way, one go the going the other way. I uh, mean, you know, to me, it suggests that um, that, um, you know, that, that, that consumers, you know, don't, number one, they don't believe the government CPI statistics, uh, but they don't believe them to a greater degree than ever before. And I think that's a, a general uh, signal of government mistrust today that is only growing and uh, and and this is what we go on is this is what's going on. This is the dilemma that the Fed has, uh, and and you know is that they're they're trying to cut interest rates. Now they are cutting interest rates. The Fed just cut interest rates today by fifty basis points. We are recording this on Wednesday, uh, by the way, and um, and uh, and yet um, you know because they're concerned uh, about in employment and and they think that they're comfortable that they brought inflation expectations uh down well you know, this michigan survey doesn't look to me like they brought inflation expectations down what's going on uh, this is the, an indication of the stagflationary type environment that we believe we're in let's go on to the next um i've updated this chart recently i've, sh I've showed it before here we're looking at the entire Magnificent Seven stocks, um, which show that um, as of, I think it was July 10th, um, the, these stocks reached a historic record level for any seven stocks. Their collective market cap or their collective enterprise value, that, that's net, net of debt, the net debt in addition to market cap of these companies, relative to GDP, uh, reached a record amount of 59.1 percent, and this was this is the high, highest valuation for any seven stocks in history. It's reminiscent of other periods 
like in 1929, like in 1972, like in the tech bubble where the largest cap stocks reflected an unusual uh, percentage of, 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 um, of GDP. Why does this matter? This is one of Warren Buffett, Buffett's favorite indicators when he, did, when he looked at, at market cap relative to the GDP of the overall market. Uh, which is also one of the reasons he's very concerned about valuations today. He wrote one of his most bearish ever uh, annual shareholder letters. Um, you know, he's concerned about valuations. I believe that's why he sold uh, almost half of his Apple recently. Um, but this, so we have record valuations for large cap growth stocks, for large mega cap tech stocks. This is a concern. I personally believe this is a bubble. I, I, I just do, and and we we remain, uh, you know, short exposed exposed on in our global macro and long short funds to these magnificent seven and large cap growth stocks. Um, and I'm, we're just showing that this might may have peaked. It may have already peaked on July 10th. Uh, let's go on to the next. Um, so, you know, we're not affiliated with Char Charlie um, Borello, but he put out a tweet that I think is is in a table here that is is really important to look at. I mean, people think that when the when the Fed cuts rates, that it's bullish. Well, it kind of depends, you know, the, you know, after the first rate cut, um, can there be a soft landing? There have been soft landing type type periods. Um, but um, and there have been, you know, not so severe kind of recessions in, in the past. Um, but but um, but this is just showing the difference between whether it's a 25 or a 50 basis point cut. And his point was that he sent this out a few days ago. But his point was that the Fed, if the Fed cuts by 50 instead of 25, it's a signal that things, you know, could be uh, you know, much worse on the economic front. And that's why they're having to cut more aggressively. And it's showing the last two times that Fed did a 50 basis point cut for the first cut. And, and that was in, 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 um, in 2007 and in 2001, right ahead of the global financial crisis and ahead of the tech bust in those two years. Uh, and the markets were down substantially. Uh, so Fed cutting rates is you know, can be bullish if we really think they can engineer a soft landing, um, but it can be bearish, especially if we're coming off of record valuations, um, which can only add to the pain in the economy if the stock market really does start coming down. Um, so Fed is concerned about employment and, the, and that's why they're cutting rates. Um, and um, but it's not such a great sign, the 50 basis point cut. It might, it might be a sign that things, the economy could be getting worse. You know, otherwise, maybe they would have just cut by 25. Uh, and on the other hand, the, the bigger cut in, in, in rates is also inflationary. And, and so we have to keep that in mind, too. So let's go down. Because the, the second part of the Fed's mandate is that they, they have to fight inflation as well as employment. And that's why they're trapped. That's why I think they're trapped. You know, never before... Have they, you know, you know, they think they've got both sides balanced in terms of supporting the labor market and supporting, uh, you know, a low inflation rate. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think they're pinned in on, on both sides. Let's go on to the next. Um, this is looking at yield curve inversions. I think Toby's going to have a chart on yield curve in, inversions, too. Uh, and we're not affiliated with, with Game of Trades, but, they, they put, you know, he put out a nice chart on, on, on Twitter that showed other times, that showed the last time that the yield curve, and, and here we're looking at the three month versus the 10 year, had, had been inverted for a record time. Uh, the three month versus the 10 year is, is, a, is a very common um, section of the yield curve to look at for predicting a, a recession. One of my professors at the University of Chicago wrote his PhD thesis on this, this um, you know, this three month versus 10 year spread and, and you know, his PhD thesis was that this is a recession indicator when this happens. And we've had like two or three out of sample recessions that have happened since he wrote that paper, that kind of proven him right, validating his thesis. 
Uh, but this is showing that the last time the, the, this, the yield curve was inverted for a record amount of time was right before the 1929 crash. And you know, personally, I think we have valuations that are just as frothy for large cap growth stocks. Let's go on to the next. Um, here's here's another you know economic data point that's a recession indicator. Uh, you know, our our equity model has been very bearish on on rest on restaurants here at the Crestcat, and one of our analysts, Nathaniel, has been uh, been helping us identify different restaurant stocks uh, that our model scoring poorly to to shorten our global macro and long short funds. Uh, but the but what's 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 going on here? This, this is a uh, an index by the the um, National Restaurant Association. Uh, it's called the Restaurant Performance Index, and it's a composite that the, the index that tracks the health of the U.S. restaurant industry, uh, and and it's um it's based on a, a couple of it's based on both their uh, current situation index as well as their um as well as their expectations index and restaurant traffic and and, and so forth uh, and but it, if you look at this this index of the health of the restaurant industry is in what looks like recession territory and um i'll just say that that is being confirmed by our equity model when we, when we score on a number of different fundamental criteria the restaurant stocks as well looks like you know just one recession indicator let's go on to the next um here we're looking at um uh the at the university of michigan consumer confidence index that had the, their headline main index from the michigan survey uh you know which which has been weakening and um in general for the past few years and it perked up a little bit recently that's the blue line uh, the green line is 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 the share of equities, um, consumer share of equities based upon the the um, the household survey of nonprofit organizations and, and uh, households and nonprofit organizations. So their ownership the ownership of financial assets among U.S. households is basically at record high territory, as shown in that green line on the right hand side of the scale. Um, and and yet uh but see how it's normally correlated with the consumer confidence index and how these two have been diverging recently this is a setup you know this is a problem you know record high ownership of of stocks uh we've shown the historically high valuations as well you know if you know this is the type of stuff that could make this re recession uh, you know, much more of a hard landing kind of a recession once it starts to unfold as stocks start to come down. We, let's go down to the next. Um, NVIDIA, uh, and um, this is, is showing the insider selling of the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Wong. Uh, he, he, has, he has a pre-planned, you know, stock sale program, which he appears to be selling to the max that is allowed under that program. Interestingly enough, it's at the same time that the company has announced a $50 billion stock buyback program. So, um, you know, you know, Jensen Wong's been selling stock at, at a clip of about 120,000 shares every other day on average for the past couple of months. I think he's already sold something like over $600 million worth of stock. Yeah, he's a multi-billionaire based upon the valuation of the stock. But he is personally selling at the same time as his company is buying back stock. Seems a little odd. It's allowable under the SEC rules and under this pre-planned stock. But look at those red bars at the top of this of this um, chart, which which basically show the amount of insider selling uh, over the last. Um, either three or five years, looks like five years, uh, you know, 3.4 billion of total sales versus 800 uh, million of buying over the last five years. But look at all the red in the last year and look at the extra concentration of red just in the last three or four months. And this is because of Jensen Wong, the CEO and chairman of the company, 
selling stock at a, at a very rapid pace. Uh, I think that may be my last slide. Uh, no, one more. So, so look, we, you know, we believe the great rotation is coming. It's, it's, it's nice to see other, other people using this great rotation idea in turn. We see a lot of Bloomberg articles recently talking about the great rotation. Um, you know, for us, the, what the great rotation is, and we've been writing about it for a few years, is this transition out of mega cap tech and overvalued large cap growth stocks and into undervalued, uh, undervalued value stocks in, in general, undervalued stocks, small and micro cap stocks, foreign stocks. Um, and, um, you know, it's a shift from growth to value. It's a shift into commodities and into inflation protection assets uh, and, and and under this, you know, higher inflation environment um, that, that we believe is going to be persistent. Um, and this is, so this chart here is just showing, um, <laughs> interestingly, this comes from the Sierra Club and, you know, is an environmental um, group basically. And, and they're basically warning that, that, that uh, uh, natural gas capacity among power plants is increasing. And they're, they're showing that uh, if the pace of what of the new capacity additions in, in the first half of the year continue, it will we'll have you know we'll have a second year in a row of record new capacity um, additions to natural gas fired power plants, uh, and of course you know we're in this energy transition and, and we're trying to you know the the powers that be uh, are trying to to get us more into. Um, into renewables, solar and wind and, and and so forth. And those things are increasing for sure, but we're still needing more gas fired, gas fired uh, nuclear power plant. You know, we're bullish on natural gas, um, but um, you know, we don't think that, you know, we're bullish on oil and gas prices right now. We think they've come down too much.